expand that a bit. Um, so yeah, so as, as you already circulated the details in email, now I've been a consultant, it was probably closer to 20 years now, but and I've worked across the system, so crisis, <laughs> inpatient, secure, secure wards, um, and also in the community, uh, and I'm an AMD and director of research in my trust, um, and I'm part-time academic, and I've also had a number of college positions over the recent years. So I'm an elected member to council, which just finished about a month or so ago. And I've also been on the general adult faculty executive. I'm currently on the London regional executive and the, and the uh, academic faculty executive. Um, and this kind of national advantage, as well as the research, has given me a bit of a, uh, a perspective on what's happening in the direction of travel. Uh, and uh, you know, one landmark really was a talk that Chris Whitty gave to the medical directors across England. And he's uh, the English um, chief medical officer. Uh, at NHS England, and, and basically he talked about the importance of prioritising mental health service provision and research over the, the coming years, because the pandemic really brought into sharp focus the deficiency in our mental health services, the extent to which they were stretched anyway, but now um, with the tide going out kind of thing, the pressure of the pandemic, they've gone from stretch to almost, almost breaking point. That's been noted, so there's this desire to try to bring uh, mental health services a bit more up to scratch. And for, uh, this is on the back of a debate that's been going on for a long time around parity of esteem, which is the idea that mental and physical health services should, should basically, um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, have a bit more equality in terms of the funding and resource and support they get from government. Nevertheless, this kind of thing has been talked about for some time, um, and it's still incumbent on us to make a, a case for better funding, better resources of our own services. Um, and to make that case, I talk about, I think about an evidence base that we often forget about, and there's been, but there's been growing for 30 years really. And that's the evidence base around the importance of therapeutic relationships. So Arlene and Gunderson did a study in 1990, and they looked at um, um, uh, basically the therapeutic relationships we have with our patients in the first six months. So that dynamic, that actual, you know, the, the, the dialogue, how that actually works, and compared that to long-term patient outcomes. And they found that there was a strong correlation between the two. The better the therapeutic alliance in the first six months, the better people's long-term outcomes. Krupnik et al. then did a, a, another study a few years later. Um, and what he found that, again, the therapeutic alliance was found to have a significant effect on clinical outcomes, both psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy. So whatever the modality of treatment, that therapeutic relationship, that the way we relate to our patients seems to have an added effect uh, and, uh, to the outcome itself. Um, Stefan Preeb, Rosemary McCabe and Stefan Preeb then did a study in 2008. And what they did is they looked at across the system, they looked at inpatient, outpatient, secure wards, community, rehab, recovery. They, they looked at it across the system. And what they found is that across a variety of psychiatric settings, this relationship is consistent uh, in that basically the therapeutic relationship is a reliable predictor of outcome. So here we have some real firm research showing how actually that relational aspect of our care has a big impact on, on people's outcomes, regardless of what else, else we do in treatment. Um, and then Sweeney did a, another study more recently, a couple of years ago, in which he looked at further literature that's developed since then and found a strong body of literature, again, which shows that therapy relations between staff and service users are quite positive outcomes. And there's something we can do, regardless of the other things that we do, there's something that we can do just in the relational aspect of our care that seems to make a big difference to patient outcomes. Now, this is not usually done optimally, it isn't the emphasis of our services, and there's a few obstacles to that, uh, which I'll go into really. The first obstacle, understandably, is lack of capacity. So it goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning. So, you know, to be able to optimize relationships, we need to have more time, and therefore we need more staff, we need more funding for our services. Um, Chloe Beale did a paper in 21, so last year, about moral injury, This the sense that um, there's lots of people who we could actually be caring for and looking after, but our services are so underfunded, and the thresholds for acceptance are so high that we can't we can't do what we know we can do. You know, we can't help people in the way we know we can. And because of that, it creates a kind of internal schism, moral injury. Uh, and it's interesting because there's another paper earlier this year in the Australian Journal of Psychiatry talking about exactly the same thing. I don't think those guys were linked to each other. So they also found independently that there is something called moral injury happening amongst psychiatrists around the world. So you know, this sense that we're not able to do what we're capable of doing because of the, the, the capacity issues that exist at the moment. This is a case for more funding, but we've never made a case for more funding based on this. We've never said that we need more funding in order to improve the relational aspect of our care. We've never argued for it on that basis. 
We've always said we need more funding in order to meet X target or uh, set up X new service. It's never really had an impact on the relational aspects of care. So um, capacity is one obstacle. The other obstacle is bureaucracy. Um, I, I mean, I'm not sure about how it is in Scotland, but in England, for sure, we have whole performance departments sitting in the back of every NHS trust. And their job is basically to extrapolate data from all of our entries in order to feed targets and KPIs, performance indicators back to commissioners. And um, that means that we have to then record a huge amount of data from different parts of the system when we've done an assessment or when we've seen a patient. Uh, and sometimes it ends up that we spend more time recording the assessment than actually doing it. Um, and, and we've got to a stage where it's more like the clinicians are serving the technology rather than the technology serving the clinicians. And I often say this, if an alien came from a different planet to have a look at our system, our mental health system, uh, and they looked at what we do all day, they'd think we're, mental, we're, we're IT professionals. Because we, a lot of our staff spend more time on computers than they do um, face to face with patients. So, um, and there's additional requirements like um, clustering and things that, that, that don't help that. Again, all of these things have never been argued against on the basis of, you know, what we need to be able to focus on the relational dimension. So it's building really over the years. Um, and the other issue is that, you know, in a lot of our services, we have fairly fragmented services. So we've got, you know, a patient might have to go an access team, a recovery team, a, a, a crisis team, and patient team. When I worked on PICU, sometimes people would have had five consultants in the last uh, six months alone. And what that tells us is that there's, there's not really much prospect of forging a decent relationship with people because they're constantly fitting between services. Um, and even NHS England has recognised this themselves now, saying that it's almost like we have a team for everything and a place for no one. Instead of having patient-centred care, we have service-centred patients, patients who learn to navigate through the system because it's so labyrinthine. Um, and on top of that, there's also the kind of short-term thinking. So a lot of our management is based on, okay, rapid throughput, let's get people in and out, a quick episode of care, quick episode of treatment, you know, short stays. Um, and without much thought to the long-term effect that might have, it might actually end up people relapsing more often and coming back more often. But our system doesn't look at that long-term. It often just looks at the short-term snapshots. Even a lot of the research at the moment is, is about that. Um, and, and also, we, we also have a lot of emphasis on systems to avoid blame and assess risk. But sometimes that inadvertently increases risk by focusing on constant risk assessments, you're not spending the time on forging the relationships that could mitigate the risk. So um, I was giving a talk like this in Wales uh, a couple of months ago, and a colleague there was saying how he was investigating a, a serious incident. And in that investigation, he found that this patient had had 18 risk assessments in the last year. Um, and so instead of having the contact that he could have had, the real sort of uh, dynamic relationship with somebody, all he kept getting was people coming to him doing a risk assessment, completing checkbox, uh, instead of really cultivating that connection. With them. It's a clear example of how the desire to avoid risk sometimes ends up making it worse. And then, of course, the, we, my trust is about to go through a CQC inspection. So, our regulator here in England is, is very concerned with measuring the most measurable. So, looking at how many forms have been filled up and this kind of stuff, uh, rather than actually looking at the quality of relationships, which takes a bit more time and effort to unearth. Um, the other obstacle is cultural. So um, there's a general culture these days in psychiatry, you're the prescriber, that's what you do. So you, by the time a patient comes to you, they're just here to talk about the medication. But actually, historically, that's never really how our profession uh, was uh, uh, kind of described. If you look at Jaspers and Blula about 100 years ago in their original psychopathology text, they actually talked about the dialogic relationship. They talked about that relational dimensional care and its importance in understanding what's happening to somebody and also being able to try to send them on a journey of recovery. And that relational aspect has always been, uh, has always been there. We've always had these two pillars in psychiatry, the technical pillar and the relational pillar. Um, and the uh, um, technical pillar in the last half century has been medication, which has always been there, always been used. And then there's the relational pillar as well. It's kind of withered in emphasis over the years, but there's a bit of a backlash against that now in that colleagues are really saying, look, I, I want to describe myself as a, psychiatrist who uh, covers all of these things and works in this more holistic way. And a term that's started to generate recently is the idea of integrative psychiatrists. So I've heard a few colleagues refer to themselves as integrative psychiatrists. And what I think that means is that uh, it means bringing the relational aspect back into the heart of care. So you've got the technical and pharmacological, then you've got the relational and therapeutic working alongside that. Uh, and that means um, uh, opening up uh, uh, to uh, having a conversation, to developing more understanding, to working more 
uh, uh, proactively with the social determinants that brought people to us in the first place, uh, with some of the trauma that have led to them coming to us in the first place, having more, therefore, trauma-informed services, um, and also being open to the cultural and spiritual influences in their lives that are so important to them and that we need to really understand and, uh, uh, and, uh, and work with in order to support them. So that more relational, integrative approach, if you like, brings a more relational approach, brings that a more integrative perspective in terms of having these multi-dimensions uh, more easily accessible uh, and working with people on those on that basis. Interesting, because CQC does a survey every year of about 17,000 services across the, the country, looking at um, what's uh, what are people's uh, experiences of care. And there's one question that has really low scores over time, which is the clinicians in my team understand what's important to me. Usually that score is 40% or less. So it's never been over 50%. And I've been looking at it since about 2015. It's never gone over 50%. So there's this idea you know, patients generally have that actually they don't understand what's important to me. And as I say, that, without that relational aspect, that will never improve you know, those figures. Um, and the final aspect, uh, I, I suppose, in, in making that relational aspect difficult is a lack of CPD around this. So Stefan Prieb in 2008 identified that clinicians actually receive little specific instruction in communication skills. And there isn't that much research on this either. That was true then. It certainly it still is true to some degree now, but it is, um, um, it's actually, um, uh, there's a bit of progress in this area. So there are some studies around person-centered models of care, systemic ways of working, trauma-informed care, and also open dialogue, which I've been doing a lot of research on recently. Uh, and, and what that basically is, is essentially combining all of these things together. So it's a very relational way of working. So staff have taught techniques in terms of how to work with patients, how to maximize that space of safety that, uh, and build that trust as much as possible in order for that relationship to be deepened. Um, but at the same time, how to work with multiple parties together. So how to bring family and friends together. So care is based around a network approach where you're working with family and friends all the way through and consistently as much as possible, um, but cultivating that relationship with them on an ongoing basis. So it's kind of like a care for the community rather than for the individual. But if the individual is on their own, you can still do that by using a lot of techniques in terms of you know, how you create that space so that they can feel more able to open up and less kind of, you know, dominated by the clinicians bringing their agenda and their techniques into it. So it does involve quite a bit of training um, and we, we're running it as a large RCT in England at the moment. It's the largest model of care uh, um, piece of research at the moment in mental health in the world right now. And we're, we're, you know, we're quite far down the road actually. We've recruited over 500 patients, which makes it a very large study. And we're following them up over the next few years. We'll probably be finished in about a similar year and a half uh, and then start to publish shortly after that. So we're well on our way with, with that at the moment. Um, I've always been interested in therapeutic relationships and what improves therapeutic relationships. So I've been doing research on this for over 10 years now. One of the first papers I published was back in 2012, and we looked at um, um, 76 clinicians from different services, um, uh, but they were mainly medics, but we also had a good cohort of psychologists, CPNs, uh, social workers, OTs, and we looked at their Freiburg mindfulness scale. So this is a scale that sort of measures mindfulness as a trait. So you may never have heard of mindfulness. You may never have meditated in your life. How much, how mindful are you just in your sort of uh, um, disposition? And it, it looked at that and it compared it to their therapeutic relationships. And we found there's a really strong correlation between the two. The higher people's mindfulness scores were, the better their therapeutic relationships were. And of course, therefore, the better the outcomes of their patients were. So we could assess a clinician and look at them and actually determine what their patient's outcomes will be just by looking at aspects of, of themselves. Um, I've been a mindfulness teacher for about 10 years now. I've been, well, more than that now. And I've been running retreats for psychiatrists. And we often ask people at the beginning, what, um, uh, what brings you here? And half of them will say, oh, it's, it's for my own good, my own personal development. And half of them will say, for my patients. And we kind of tend to say, well, that's actually, that's good because it actually does both. You know, we can work on ourselves in order to support our patients. And this is probably because the description of therapeutic relationships usually involves the ability to be present in the moment and to follow the patient from one moment to the next rather than having kind of a pre-planned map of how a session should go. And that's actually a very mindful quality. So, you know, there's something around that. And in the open dialogue training, for example, we actually train clinicians in mindfulness, not as an intervention, as some person development for ourselves to help us practice better and more relationally. Um, and it, it's interesting because this training can help us improve our therapeutic relationship, this kind of thing. And one of the first clues to that was when I first joined the council about six years ago, there was a, a, a sort of bit of research done by the National Survivor User Network and the Royal College. And um, they uh, basically were trying to understand what, um, 
uh, what people think about psychiatrists. So they asked them, what do you think about your psychiatrist? And it's interesting because the response is really dichotomous. But a chunk of them said, I, I think they're fantastic. They saved my life. I absolutely recommend them. They're wonderful people. Another chunk said, I can't stand them. I think they're terrible. They really ruined my life. And I never recommend them to anyone. And there wasn't much in between. We're trying to understand the difference. And one of the things, just a little bit of hint in the data suggested that actually colleagues that get the first response tend to be the ones who approach patients with more humility, going in to make judgments and conclusions uh, less easily and less quickly. Uh, um, uh, whereas those who kind of come in quite early, uh, uh, don't spend as much time listening, seem to get those responses. Um, but you know, that led to some more research on the back of that. And what's interesting is that trainings like Open Dialogue et cetera, can actually move you across uh, the spectrum in terms of helping us work more, more relationally. I think it's always a work in progress, so we can always improve our perfect uh, our relational way of working. Um, but the first thing is to make it, put it on the agenda, really. So in summary, really, what, what I'm suggesting is that um, we can really improve our services by improving the relational aspect of it. In order to, to get that to really happen, we need more capacity, more funding for our services, and we can make an argument for that, I think, on this more coherent basis. We, can, we need less bureaucracy, um, uh, in our system, so sort of bonfire of the bureaucracy, again, on the basis of the argument of the importance of relational care, which hasn't been made for a change in the culture around our roles. So the understanding that actually, you know, we do have two aspects to our roles. It's not just uh, prescribing uh, and also more training in order to constantly perfect that relational aspect of our, our understanding of the relational uh, ways of forging relationships. Now, clearly, this is something that we need to do at a national level. So the Royal College, that's why I'm active in it, continue to be active standing for elections and that kind of stuff. Um, it's also uh, uh, something we need to do in partnership with things like the Royal College of Nursing, British Psychological Society, British Association of Social Workers, uh, this kind of thing. I think that's going to be essential uh, going forward. But on the, that, while that work is going on at national level, what can we do you know, locally? And I think the kind of things we can do is um, build our own skills uh, and keep uh, up to date with what the latest evidence is so, uh, and what the latest techniques are. So in my blog, which you saw a little bit of uh, I understand last time, and um, uh, the, um, in that, I talk about some of the latest research around relational ways of working in therapeutic relationships. Um, I talk about where the trainings are that helps you to learn these things. And, and we also invite colleagues on from pilot teams and places like that who have been working, say, in the Open Dialogue trial, we've got pilot teams across the country, we invite some consultants from there to talk about what it's like to work in this way, what their teams are, how their teams are working. Um, and we also talk about you know, what kind of trainings there are at the moment for people to do. If you're not already subscribed, and you know, feel free to put your details in the chat, and I'd be happy to uh, uh, put you on the subscriber list so you can get the vlog once a month. Some of you may do that. Well, I'll, I'll kind of end there. Uh, I'll stop sharing and give us good time for a, a, a good uh, dialogue. Okay. Thanks, Russell. Um, that's good. So we've got we've got about thirty-five minutes, haven't we? Or maybe a bit less to have a, a discussion, haven't we? Um, and, and I guess it's, um, it's, a, it's pretty much a free for all. But can I can I start? If that's all right, a bit cheeky. But just with the open dialogue mm. uh, way of working, could you just mm. describe how that actually happened? So there's the the, the patients in the centre of the the system. Is that mm. right? And they yeah. they invite the network, as it were, around them. Yeah. So I guess the difference is the first thing is that let's say someone's referred. Um, into the system is usually kind of higher level. So when people have a crisis or more complex needs, uh, in our trial, we, we, we pegged it in terms of they have to reach a certain level of severity to get open dialogue. Once they're referred in and they, they, you know, in sort of CPA type level of care, once we look like they need that kind of care, the first difference is that we start immediately to ask on the phone in the referral, who else is important in your life? Who else, you know, can, can be involved with your care? Who can help and support? And there's good research to show that actually about 50% of patients have people who they wanted to be involved, but were never really asked to join. So who else can be involved? Because they are part of your recovery too. We want to bring them into the system. So then what we do is we then start to have what are called network meetings with the other relatives, and, uh, or it could be friends, colleagues, neighbours, anybody. Together. And we form what's called a network meeting together with a couple of clinicians who we want to stay with them for their whole journey in the system. Right? So if they go from one team to another team to another team, we want these clinicians to be with them all the way through. And ideally, this is their team. So we're now forming our teams into hubs. I'm trying to implement this in my trust on a widespread basis beyond the pilots. And we're forming hubs within teams. So a patient is not referred, doesn't have one care coordinator, they have a hub. And that hub is the clinicians who join the network meetings and they will always be with them. And you might have 
three one day and two another you know, depending on who's on leave it's the, the, the seen by their hub um and so you form a community around the crisis um and staff are really taught to use sort of i mean the, the teaching actually is a family therapy qualification so at the end of the one year training you get a foundation level qualification of family therapy and it, you know family therapists uh, help in delivering the training and you learn skills in terms of relational questioning you know, uh, helping people form these connections with each other, circular questioning, this kind of stuff. Um, and you also learned very much about the importance of creating a space. So we're very much trying to encourage the a key word in open dialogue is polyphony. So we want to bring about as many voices as possible. And that might be different voices in the same patient in terms of different perspectives. There might be different voices in the room. We're not trying to create consensus, certainly not for most of the meeting. We want to see all the different voices. And so if we try to bring everybody together, then people will stop, you know, piping up about what's been important. So we really, we really want to hear those different voices. Towards the end of the meeting, we might want to agree on just a couple of things of consensus. Mike, should we meet again? And if so, when would you like to meet? And to be honest with you, nine out of 10 times, because we caught people in a kind of crisis time, the only decision we tend to make is let's do another one of these. And then these open dialogue meetings end up being a lot of the care they get. Well, be the only care they get, because sometimes people say, look, can I have a one-to-one -one with you to talk about this? or they might be, can I have a medication review you separately? But this becomes then a backbone of care, and it, it might be frequent, like weekly, or it, you know, it might then go down uh, after the initial period to monthly or a couple of times a year. Now I see people I see a couple of times a year, one more than that. Um, and then when we discharge people, we give them that assurance that as long as these staff are still in the team, if you need anything, don't have to go through hoops and GPs, et cetera, just come straight back to us. The same people will form the same network with you again, and maybe you just have a one or two network meetings, or you might come back onto the case layer altogether. But we want that consistency to continue as lifelong as possible. The re one thing that we can report from the study now is that the retention in the teams is, is huge compared to treatment as usual. We've got staff in our teams who, uh, in our control group, the staff group have re re been replaced 100% in the three years of the trial so far. Whereas in the open dialogue group, we've lost about 20% of staff. And Almost all of those are only because the team is small. So to get a, to a higher banding, you've got to leave the team. Um, otherwise, they'll still be there. I mean, the Finns who started Open Dialogue in the 80s are still in the same team. They're either still in the same team or did by now, but they're, they're, they've sort of stayed in the same job. So the retention is huge. And that's really good because it enables that continuity of care to carry on beyond discharge. Um, so in a nutshell, that's kind of how it tests to differ. And there's a range of techniques that we tend to teach staff. Um, and a big part of the training, there's techniques aren't, aren't you know, they're not hugely complicated and they're not that varied, but the big part of the training is actually a lot of personal development. So we do mindfulness, we do family genograms, the team really bonds with each other, it's really important. And they have regular kind of team personal development days once a month or so to really work on that aspect of themselves. Um, and then in the team meetings, we have a reflective space where people can start to reflect with each other about their personal, their subjective experience of a particular case. Like I was in an in a open dialogue clinical team meeting this morning and there there was a staff member talking about her feelings around being feeling rejected by a family who said that they don't want to work with her, and she was sharing that with a colleague and that so, you know that subjective space is really fundamental to it all and, and it's one of the techniques we use in the open dialogue network meetings where clinicians are asked to talk to each other in front of the network and share their subjective feeling around what's happening and that way you don't have to be that directive actually because they listen to what you're thinking and they, they can respond to that so we're also trying to demonstrate that open dialogue there and then that's like gives you a bit of an idea of what yeah, these yeah. overall. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. So has anybody else got any comments or questions they might want? I really like the expression. Uh, sorry, carry on. No, after you, Bob. I really like the expression bonfire of the bureaucracy. Um, and, you know, if you, if, if you were in a position where you could make changes in that way, I, I wonder how you would go about trying to make that happen. Because I, I think, I mean, I was just listening to Ian McGilchrist uh, last night on a podcast, and he's, you know, maybe know his work, left brain and right brain, and yes, you know, yes, he's saying yes. that sort of over bureaucratization of, of, yes. of everything is very much left brain stuff. And, yes. you know, um, and he was making that point quite wittily, actually. He'd given a talk at Oxford and he spent about three hours trying to get some money they'd offered him for it in a kind of right. crazy way. And, and, right. and how, how would you go about engaging 
with that problem because it yeah. is a problem a lot of people recognize yeah good question can you send me a link to that podcast by the way that's, I, he's great he's up in your part of the world isn't he he's, he's retired well, in he's Scotland, in S- sky on the west coast actually yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you say he, did you say retired yeah, that's why I understand. Like, my God, he's not retired. He spent the last twelve years writing a book that's even bigger and have a, had had better critical acclaim than the first book. Called... Yeah, clinically retired, I think. He's yeah, saying, yeah, yeah. I've tried to send patients to him. Yeah, yeah, clinically retired. Because yeah. and he's somebody who knows yeah. about bureaucracy because he used to be clinical director at Maudsley. At the Maudsley, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so he and I, you know, similar role to what I have. And yeah, the bureaucracy is is hideous. And the thing is, though, it's never been attacked on the basis of this is harming patients. Right. Nobody's really made that made the case on that basis that, you know what, by locking our, uh, our, our clinicians down to computers, we're taking away from patient time. And almost certainly this is affecting their outcomes. Um, and there hasn't been a concerted effort, but be an effort that is based on some real data around the harm it actually does to patients by taking away face time and the importance of face time. We, we don't see any arguments about the importance of face time. And, and because of that, it's gradually taken away. So I'd approach it on that basis. The, you know, the Royal College, say the Adrian James, the current president, he's in and out of Downing Street quite often. I mean, he told me that just the other day. They have a significant influence on policy. And, uh, you know, uh, personally, I think that we should be using that kind of influence in, in policy in terms of saying, OK, w- what have we done here in terms of creating a massive beast of KPIs that are coming in? If we're really serious about mental health, we need to cut the red tape. You, you put that out in terms of campaigns, you correlate that with the emphasis that mm-hmm. has rightly happened in the media on, on on mental health recently and i think we can make some real progress in those things it's just never been on the agenda it's never mind high on the agenda it's never been on the agenda so putting on the agenda really pushing for it i think there's a lot that can be done occasionally you hear about trust have, have, you know kind of really had at it and tried to remove some bureaucracy and they've done a reasonable job at doing it some at local level but then there's all the national layers of bureaucracy. Mm. but i think that we can really make that happen but it has to be a almost a moral campaign i think that's possible um, but it does require you know considered effort and i think that for a lot of these campaigns, we need to unite with, say, the psychologists and nurses and social workers and make that point coherently. So I think I think a lot is doable. We don't know how much until we try, and we haven't really tried before. Yeah, that's, that would be my first yeah, suggestion. Great. Thank you. Alistair, I think you were going to um, pitch in there. Oh, thanks, David. Um, thank you very much for the talk. That's uh, lots of really interesting ideas. Can I just, just probe the, the original um, sort of uh, centerpiece saying that therapeutic relationships are, are correlated with better outcomes. Mm-hmm. How do those pieces of research know it's not patients who already have a head start or a better prognosis that build better relationships with psychiatrists, or yeah. indeed that the psychiatrists find it easier to form relationships with those patients who are already better? Yeah, so they've done so most of this research, there's so much research now that, that what's happened is that they've managed to um, uh, uh, they've managed to try to average out different populations and the control group and the groups they've been looking at. So um, it's been, you know, there's been relatively random selections in trying to look at the differences. Um, and they've looked at characteristics of different patient groups and found that there's no consistent difference in characteristics between these groups. Uh, and so the number of different studies that looked at this have come at it from enough angles for us to get a bit of a meta-analysis take on it that actually, yeah, it, that is a hypothesis that needs needed to be looked at. And what they find in each type, each case is that actually there's a, the correlation is actually very strong regardless of any confounding factors. So they have tried to look at other variables and found that actually it's that, and, 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 and select the samples based on other possible variables. So transdiagnostically, uh, also demographically, um, and in terms of other issues, they've looked at um, personality inventories and other things and seen if there's any differences between the two. But it's kind of been a consistent finding. Um, yeah, and there's been so many, so in Stefan Preeb's study, in 2008, he looked at a, a huge, he looked across the whole of Europe actually. So he had a really large sample. And again, he was able to try to um, uh, uh, avoid, uh, examine all the different variables. And again, they found similarly that that, that is a consistent regardless. So um, I can imagine that a therapeutic relationship with, with um, say a patient who um, has, uh, it has more issues around boundaries, you know, more trauma might be harder than, a, and is harder than a patient who doesn't. But then, if you have two patients that are the same, you can still improve the outcome with better therapeutic relationships. You know? So while there is a difference in the ability to perform therapeutic relationships, when we're comparing like with like, there still is an impact that you could have with the you know, different therapeutic relationships. And then what I've spent a lot of time doing is trying to understand 
what is it that makes a difference? You know, what are those specific techniques and ways of working that makes a difference? And in my vlog, I go through a lot of some of those things, you know, the specific um, uh, uh, things that seem to make a difference. And that's what has attracted me to things like OpenDAO, which, which is wholly sort of orientated towards, you know, really perfecting those, those aspects of care. Thanks, thank you. We just just make a very very brief comment about that as you're talking it's interesting because probably from your more very integrated way of talking about things so you'd like to say ways of being rather than techniques and ways of working but we're shoehorned into doing that aren't we yeah i mean we, we also it's it's not, they're not easy things to understand because they're not they're not things like uh, um you know things that we can describe either in terms of psychological you know interventions or the kind of interventions we more often do, the technical pharmacological interventions. So trying to find the language. So for example, the Finns, when they started Open Dialogue in the 80s, they kept it to themselves for about at least a decade uh, and didn't really talk about it. They were doing very well. They were doing research. The research as it started to filter out, got more and more people interested. And there's one sort of Harvard academic, a couple of them who, who flew to Finland to learn about it. And, so, uh, and the first thing they said is that this definitely is very different. It's making a difference we need to write this down. And the Finns were against writing it down. They were like, well, if you try to formalize this, it won't really work. And the Americans were saying, well, you're never ever going to allow anyone else to benefit from this unless you find a way to articulate it. And there was a five year long debate, which I kind of ended and it, I got in at the tail end of and, and sort of said to the Finns, listen, we can do some mega research on this. Um, but you need to do what the Americans have said and, and formula, formulate it more. And that's when we start talking about techniques and things like this, which was which was just a convenience for research. Really. And you're right. You know, ideally we talk about ways of being, and we, we we you know mindfulness is a big part of the training. I speculated that I thought mindfulness was a big part of what will help clinicians to work in this way. And now and it was a new thing. The Finns had never used that in their training, and now it's used in open dialogue training all over the world because they've kind of picked it up from us. Actually, this seems to so it's, it's just the, you know, the dispositional way that you, you react with people that seems to be key to this. Um, but yeah, the descriptions are always going to be difficult uh, with this. And I totally understand why the Finns didn't want to go down that road at all. Mm -hmm. But hopefully it will help when we get the studies completed. In there. I think both Mark and Mark. Yeah. Mark? Yeah. Um, I don't know if it... If I, maybe connects to that last bit about the, um, the Finns and the Americans. But I suppose I was just thinking about this. I mean, I'm very, it's very sympathetic to the, to the model and it sounds really good. And I was also just thinking about the, the system's uh, interest in the model, but also the boundaries of the system in the sense of, uh, um, you know, relationships correlating with mental illness outcome, but also, I suppose I was just thinking about culture relationships outside of mental outside of mental health systems in a sense, mm -hmm. and then thinking I was suppose I was wondering about that in terms of the Scandinavian and American wider systems um, yeah. and what happens in wider systems, which uh, influences what happens in the kind of subsystems, including yeah. the interest in measuring, uh, yeah. including um, an interest in. Uh, funding, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, relationships are um, associated with, or the nature of relationships being associated with those cultural things. And I wonder if you've got comments on that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. I mean, this is really important stuff. So, so yeah, if, I guess we can think about it in terms of the culture and the wider influence of the culture and then the system itself and the influence that the system has on uh, how we deliver care. And I guess the the cultural thing is very interesting because you know, Finns have quite a distinct culture. Actually, that they, I've noticed that they're they're a lot more open to being very direct with each other than we are, uh, and and what they would consider a fairly normal discourse we might consider rude. Because I noticed this when I was having my first debates with the Finns about some of this, the way they're talking to each other it kind of surprised me. Like, are they having a row, but they weren't. They were just sort of, this is how they talk. And so I was realizing that there, there is a cultural difference here. So if we look at that, uh, the, the one is the cultural difference. The other is. Um, the system itself and how that works and how that responds to this kind of thing. Um, I guess the answer to, to both these things, you know, our system is very, very hierarchical. The NHS is an extremely hierarchical system. So it's hard to get a dialogical system within a hierarchical system like that. Um, 
Uh, I always say that you have to start somewhere, right? So we're trying to start somewhere within our services. What, what we've tried to do is, and there's an understanding from the Finns that what we need to try and do is form adaptations of it in every country that fits with that culture. So the way that we have our reflections, for example, the way that clinicians might talk to each other about the family is probably a bit different in the UK than say it would be in Finland. That, and I imagine that when they share with each other in front of the family, they would say things in a more pointed way than we do. We're, we're trying a bit harder. The Americans spotted this first. They said that we have more tendency to make nice in our reflections compared to say the Finns. Um, so there's slight difference in, in nuances, but we can work with that as we build it in each country. Um, and in order to do that work, to build it, to show how variants exist, but the fundamental core of what we're trying to do is, is similar in the same across the board. There is an international research group called Hope and Dialogue, which the Italians set up. So there are open dialogue teams across the, the, the world now, actually. So they're in South America, Italy, Germany. Um, uh, the, there's a, a whole bunch of training going on in Portugal at the moment, in the Far East, uh, um, in Japan. Yeah, there's, so, so, so what Hope and Dialogue is, is a collection of researchers from each of these countries. And our trial, the UK trial called the DESI, is the biggest one in the world. And what we've all agreed to do is to copy the data sets we used from Odessi and use, do similar evaluations in each of these, in a number of these countries. And we're trying to get funding in order to fund another six or seven trials around the world, to demonstrate <laughs> reproducibility in different contexts. Um, and, and also we're doing some um, qualitative work in terms of understanding how it looks slightly different in each of these contexts. So adapting to the culture, and there's always been this agreement over adaptations to cultures uh, with some fundamental aspects in common. So that is being looked at and thought about, and this international project is really helping us and we kind of come together every now and then um, to compare notes and most importantly, actually, to compare the research so that we're doing similar, we're researching similar things so that we can build a consistent, coherent evidence base. Um, yeah, and then of course there's the system itself, you know, and how do you implement it in the system? And this, this I guess, is something we can only learn by doing it. So we, we implemented it in small pilot teams across seven different parts of the UK in the trial. And now in a couple of those parts, they're expanding it in a big way across the whole mental health system, like in my trust. And that is, it raises a lot of questions in terms of how the system can receive that, right? Because it's so risk orientated and, and um, so defensive that how can we you know, enable this kind of practice? And we're learning about having that dialogue with management and how that kind of works um, and how we can get reassurances and this kind of stuff. Because it fundamentally actually reduces risk because you're forming deeper relationships with people. You've got a better idea of what's going to happen. Uh, so, that, that systems approach, um, you know, or the, the, the way that we integrate it into our system is something that we're learning. I think each country will have to learn about that process. How do you bring it into your system? Mm -hmm. uh, the Netherlands had a really interesting experience. It, it, was, it took hold within less than six months. We had seven open dialogue teams across the country. And then about a couple of months, and then a, three years down the line, a lot of those uh, ones, were, they were trying to stop some of these teams because a whole new cadre of management came along. So we're interestingly watching their journey too. Not so, not so easy. It was easy at the beginning, but it's looking not so easy now. So yeah, just watching that 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 sort of organic process of back and forth in these different countries trying to deliver it. But there's just so many cohorts of clinicians yeah. who are passionate about it. That's what keeps it going. But you're right; the system is fundamental to the ability to actually deliver on this, uh, and the culture really is fundamental to the the nature of it, you know, which will be slightly different in each place. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, Leonie, then Chris. Okay, uh, uh, thanks, Russell. Um, I, I just wish the world was designed with the patient in the centre, really, as you've described, because I think there's lip service to it, but, but um, it doesn't really, really happen in an authentic way, I think. Um, just two, two collections of thoughts. One was about the psychotherapy body of evidence and about the um, common factors research that's gone on for a long time. And, and the evidence there that those common factors, those Rogerian relational factors uh, account for the a, a, a huge bulk of the variance between different psychotherapies and that the therapeutic relationship is the single biggest um, yes. source of the variance. So that was one thing which reflects really what you're saying. Um, the other set of thoughts I had was around training and, and how I guess those of us who've been in practice a long time can change our ideas, um, but it seems to me that um, intervening, you know, certainly with young psychiatric trainees and maybe even earlier to get these ideas that 
you can be relational <laughs> in all sorts of simple ways that make a difference and really get it in then then and I yeah. just wondered. Yeah, so you're very right, Leonie, about um, you know the common factors in psychotherapy research, and that is a, is another huge layer of research that goes on top of all the re therapeutic relationship research in psychiatry. You've got the whole, whole area of psychotherapy, which again shows that you know the difference between different therapies is far less uh, than the actual fundamental factors that seem to make a difference within each of these therapies. So fascinating that, and that that, that exactly as you say, that kind of joins up to create a really powerful body of research now uh, in making the same point. Um, and in terms of how we train people, one thing, one fundamental that we've realized is that you have to train teams. It's not really good enough to train individuals. Um, and this is where other attempts in this direction have not succeeded. So there have been some ideas about, you know, family intervention training and things like this, that they've tried to roll out in different places. And the odd keen CPN might go on a training like this or a psychiatrist. But then they end up working the same way after a year or so, because it's never really been adopted by the team. And what we've done is we've taken whole teams. So, for example, there's an EIP team in Cheshire. We've trained the whole of their team now. Um, and then, you know, in my services, we're looking to train at least 50% of each of our new community teams. So that way, um, you work into a different ethos, um, and you're all sharing that with each other. And then we part of the training is about how you do the team meeting as well as how you see patients. And that is very much that reflective space and helps you maintain that ethos. Uh, and also part of it is having peer workers, actually, bringing peer workers into every team. So in the UK, we call it peer supported every dog, which we stole from the Americans who were the first people to use peer workers. The Finns never did. But when Obamacare came about in 2012, they had about $50 million to invest in mental health care in downtown New York. And they invested it in an open dialogue service called Parachute. But because they had similarly fragmented networks to, you know, from a lot of their patients, they invested a lot of it in peer workers who helped form the networks with, with patients and connect them to the community. But also interestingly, help keep the team you know, grounded in terms of this way of working. Um, so we call it peer support over now. We have peer workers in every team. That also makes a difference. So the nature, the complexity of the team, bringing them on board, uh, making it a whole sort of center of gravity shift. That seems to be what, what makes a difference, I think. Because if we, and when there's been individuals trained, gone back to the individual teams, it has withered basically. So yeah, we've had we've been training for about seven years now. So we've had quite a few different experiments. The team-based training is what, what has been consistently successful. So I guess it has to include that relational space. And I guess the individuals have to experience that rather than have an individual understanding of, of, of something theoretical, maybe. That's right. And we get the teams to work together on personal development. So they might pair up and do genograms together in the training. So I think about the Devon team, for example. They were coming from four different teams. There was about 12 clinicians from four different teams, and they were going to form an open dialogue team for the trial as the first team. They didn't know each other from Adam when they started, but by the end of it, they were a really tight group who'd done a lot of personal work with each other, and they knew each other so well. I remember calling them about a couple of months into the training. They were all on a boat somewhere. I didn't do this in Devon. They are all on a boat somewhere, <laughs> sailing together, you know, as a team. It was wonderful to see that cohesiveness build up. And that kind of work that they'd done... A, a, with each other, and you see this in the Finns, you know, the way that they connect with each other really helps to maintain this way of working and that ethos. Um, and they can be really frank with each other. Then, you know, like, you know what I think. Like I was in a discussion with a team this morning when they were talking about how some feelings they had of rejection from a family, and then one of the team members was, was saying, "Well, you know what? I think we are the awkward ones. The way that we run our service can be quite awkward." Uh, and uh, um, if they feel inflexible to us, I think we probably feel very inflexible to them, which is contrary to what other people say. But they feel, felt free enough to do that and develop that connection. But that's really fundamental to it, yeah. Doing it on a team basis, building that ethos, creating that relational space between them. Thank you. Chris. Hello, hi. Um, hi. Thank, you, thank you very much for, for your time. And I suppose it's just to quickly echo other other people's thoughts are that you know i mean this stuff sounds so uh sounds so fundamental um the idea that that good therapeutic relationships are an essential part of our care it's almost quite remarkable that you're having to do this and you're having to yeah. you, know, you know that this hasn't been done before but thank you you know it's, it's very good that somebody is doing it although it's a a sad state of affairs that, that someone's having to or that it's not yeah. been done before but um my, my question and I suppose I want to frame it with a caveat so I'm, I'm not very familiar with open dialogue at all and I'm certainly not familiar with the evidence base but I am aware that there is there has been some criticism of the evidence base I think there was a 
and I don't know if you're familiar with the mental health blog yeah. and they, 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 it kind of summarizes research and they did a piece on there was, there was a Freeman review by Freeman which reviewed the evidence base for open yeah. dialogue and it wasn't overly yeah. positive and yeah. it, it kind of was raising concerns about the quality of the trials and so on yeah. and I suppose I was just wondering I mean there's obviously problems with RCTs in as an approach to yeah. assessing outcomes in in this way yeah. with with kind of therapeutic interventions anyway but it was i suppose it, my, my question is what would you say to kind of i'm, a, I'm aware that there are critics that question the kind mm -hmm. of the evidence base to, to open dialogue and i suppose mm -hmm. i'd be interested to hear what your response would yeah so the interesting thing is that that, that paper from freeman was from actually our group so right. um right. Yeah, and and um it created a little bit of excuse me the group tiny bit but it, the purpose of it we all signed up to which is that we do need to talk about the status of current evidence in order to justify applying for the funding to get a bigger study. So what we're saying is that, yes, the evidence base probably isn't enough to roll it out, you know, in complete in its entirety. However, there's aspects of it that, you know, is, is kind of basic standard person-centered care, which we yeah. should be able to do anyway. But as an entire model across the system, that would require another round of uh, research. And so we commissioned that paper in order to make the for further research. So certainly is the case that if you're going to implement it as an entire model in the system, you do need research in order to be able to do that. Um, but um, other aspects of it, so it's interesting because there's a difference between open dialogue and dialogical practice. So open dialogue is the whole model. Dialogical practice is using aspects of the model in the way that you work. And that is easier to do, more adaptable, and you can, you can use some specifics um, in the way you work. Uh, and so the latter we have permission for already, because you know, it's kind of not just evidence from that, but all the relational uh, uh, therapeutic relationship research is, is feeds into that. The open dialogue itself, yes, I mean, that's fine, it's true. If, if people say you need more evidence, I would say, yeah, you do. That's why we're doing it. You know? yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's why we got 4 million quid from NIHR um, to fund a massive trial across seven, seven parts of the country. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll wait and see what the evidence is. You know, um, There's some things that we have some idea of, but, but you know, the, the final word will come about when the trial is released um and yeah so you know i'm, I'm sympathetic to the idea that a, a bigger evidence space is needed that sure. is they hadn't done anything randomized for us that's the problem but right. i can understand someone says well how do you know it wasn't the water or the weather that changed that made it all different there i can't say for sure that's not true i mean i don't think it is mm. it's pretty obvious and and hopefully once we do the research hopefully if it does demonstrate what we think it will if we show the difference that the fin showed was vast i mean it was off the charts they had something like um 74% of all their first episode of psychosis within two years left the service and never came back, right? It, it's more like 7% in these countries, right? It's, it's, it was like 10 times higher recovery rate than anywhere else. And so- if you, Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, if you look at all the data in, in, in most of our countries, it's still around here, and then the Finns are over here. So people, uh, people don't like that, you know, if it's a complete outlier. So if we show a, a fraction of that difference, just a, and our trial is predicated on something like a 10th of that difference, if we do, then it's a statistically significant finding. We show a fraction of that difference. It will be a game changer, right? Yeah. So, you know, we've got to wait and see what, what, what comes through from that. And I think it's fair enough that people ask for that. Um, yeah, let's see what we can show. Thank you. We're, we're coming towards the end of our time, aren't we, uh, Russell? Because you, you have to go, yeah. I think you said, round about eight. Yeah. Um, can I just ask one thing yeah. on the back of it, which is just about conflict? It, it's, it sounds like a very, um, uh, the whole system sounds very cooperative and collaborative and so on. But, but uh, mental health care is fraught with different conflicts, isn't it? So what happens if you have a patient-centered system when there is, um, where, where coercion is in the air and yeah. maybe the Mental Health Act yes. is its ugly head? Yes, good question. So I've actually sectioned several people under an open dialogue uh, system. And the difference is that we totally accept that you know, there's going to be lots of times when you're going to have to start to trigger some of these things. Um, but we completely accept that when that happens, what we want to do is still try and maintain some dialogical space. So for example, when it's been, it hasn't always been possible, but most of the time it has been possible that in a mental health assessment, I will have a reflection with my colleague, the social worker. There's a brilliant social worker in Devon, by the way, We've written up a whole paper around how to do mental health act assessments dialogically and we have a reflection together because often what happens is you, you do the assessment then you go away somewhere make a decision and then declare it like god uh, but in open dialogue what we're trying to do is we have the discussion in front of the patient if it's safe to do 
and then they can see our anguish and our uncertainty and our sense of failure because we never wanted to be here. Uh, and the outcome will be the same right, as it would have been, but the, the ability to maintain the relationship is a lot stronger. So when I've done that, and then I've gone to the ward to meet them, they've been quite you know, grateful and not as antagonistic as would have previously been the case. So we're trying to do everything we can to maintain that relational dimension of care. And even through this most, the highest level of conflict, we still try to do it. Even if it's not possible, it might not be possible, but leading up to that point, they will have heard us reflect and think about what's happening before then. So we're trying to share our inner process with them as much as possible, but hopefully we'll create some improvement. And of course, even the Finns found 15, 20% of people had the same outcomes as they did in treatment as usual. So that's still going to happen. Uh, but with, with a number of people, we were able to use that relation aspect, even in situations of conflict, to improve that therapeutic relationship and therefore hopefully the outcome. Right, right. yes, thanks. Uh, has has anyone got any last comments or or questions before we we wrap up? Because I'm assuming Russell that you need to be off. Yeah, in the next couple of minutes. I mean, uh, certainly can take another question if. if uh, can I say something yeah, sure. else? <laughs> yeah. Just just occurred to me as you were speaking there, um, Russell. Um, is it's about something about whether or not some measures are different whether the quality of the patient's experience is different, isn't that important as well as other Yes, yes. Um, so the trial, yeah, the trial is both qualitative and quantitative. So we've got the RCT going, we're measuring things like time to relapse. We want to show that you relapse less often or less quickly in open dialogue than treatment as usual, less hospitalization, better symptom scores, better functions. And also we're measuring the family's mental health and physical health around it as well, seeing if that differs. But also we're doing a, there's, there's a whole qualitative arm. So we're doing focus groups of, of patients, of carers uh, and, and of clinicians all the way through. So there's a large, large narrative being built along with it. So that the study mm -hmm. yeah, was both those things running in, in concert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, th thank you very, very much indeed. It's been very stimulating and um, very energetic. And, and I, I suspect it will tune in with an awful lot of um, the values and concerns of, of our little group here, actually. Yeah, um, thanks very much. Well, thank you for doing it.